my, my grandmother. But she did something to our family that had severe ramifications. Actually, it was a despicable thing. I still love her. She was a wonderful, gracious Christian woman. She was awarded by Elizabeth II, member of the British Empire, for her social activism in our region, just north of Sydney. But she did something that almost ruined our family and ruined a life in the family. My grandmother was a very wealthy businesswoman, so I knew her in her late 70s and 80s. As she came to the point where she was going to go to heaven, she reinforced her will and said to the family, it's the business, she had a very wealthy business, was going to be evenly divided amongst all the six siblings, including my mother. When my grandmother died, the will was read, every single dollar in the business went to the eldest son. And that caused turmoil within the family because mother had lied and had lied for years, promising something and then changing the will. Especially the youngest of the daughters, my Auntie Ruth, she took it really bad. She became very bitter and resentful against the eldest son and his family and against the dead mother. Maybe it was a coincidence, but within months after the will was read with my auntie Ruth very intensely bitter against her mother and the eldest brother, she contacted rheumatoid arthritis very severely. And I think there is a relationship between mind and body. Not always, but I believe in this case that her unforgiveness, her resentment and bitterness against the family affected her Emotions that affected her body. I can still remember my mother calling me on the phone and telling me, my, my Auntie Ruth, who was so always joyful and happy and gracious and giving and generous, had died at a very, very young age. Complications of this disease. I'm talking about forgiveness. I'm talking about unforgiveness. It's crucial to understand the processes of forgiveness and what can happen to us through hanging on and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. Jesus taught a lot about it. Matthew 6 and Matthew 18. The Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9 to 12. We know it. Our Father, who art is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day. Oh, I'm getting, I know that, I know that Lord's Prayer so well. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we stop at verse 12. And we're so familiar. My mother taught that prayer to me when I was five. I can, I've got a mental picture of me kneeling down at this massive bed, which was probably a single bed. I was only a little one. And her teaching me the Lord's Prayer. But it doesn't stop in verse 12. It goes on. And Jesus teaching about not to be public in our righteousness with prayer and fasting and giving, but do it secretly under the Lord and teach us this prayer. But the prayer goes on. And Jesus emphasizes one component out of the Lord's Prayer and one and one only. It's not bread and it's not thy kingdom come. It's forgiveness. In verse 13 and 14, it continues. It doesn't stop in verse 12. 13 and 14, Jesus teaching about forgiveness goes a step further and says, if you forgive your brother, your sister, the sin they've done against you, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive your brother or sister that has sinned against you, then your heavenly Father won't forgive you. Ever read that? 
We don't usually deal with that verse because we believe in the graciousness through the blood of Jesus and forgiveness of sins for all time as we walk faithfully with Jesus. We don't ever think that God would not forgive us if we don't forgive someone else. Matthew 6, 13 and 14. So how do you handle that? I think there's an inkling of what Jesus means by forgiveness and unforgiveness in that sense in Matthew 18 in his teaching. From verse 15 through to the end of the chapter, the whole context is about forgiveness and unforgiveness. If a brother sins, Matthew 18, 15, then you go to the brother, the sister, and you talk to them if they listen. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven, loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Where I am, where you are, there I am in the midst. And in the context of all that, Peter says, how many times should I forgive someone that sins against me? Seven? Seventy times seven, innumerable number. And then Jesus goes on and talks about the parable of the guy who has someone owe him a dollar, yet he owes the emperor a million dollars. Remember that parable? And because he hasn't forgiven, he's going to be sent to the torturers and tormented because your father in heaven won't forgive you if you don't forgive others. I, th I think Jesus' teaching, it's serious. <laughs> it's crucial to the Christian life. We sit here and say we don't have issues with people, where people push against us, cut in line, come up the shoulder of the road in a traffic jam and cut in. People say things against us, look at us a funny way. We carry these burdens and hang on to things. For years, whether people are dead or alive, family tensions, things that are done within the family that you have no control over, that influences you for the rest of your life and every other single family member. What do you do about that? People make bad decisions, poor decisions within your family and it affects you and you're innocent. What do you do about that? Hang on like Auntie Ruth <laughs> to resentment, unforgiveness. There are no tensions here in the Billy Graham Center building. <laughs> Faculty, staff, staff, administrators, student, professor, professor, student. You name the con combination, there's tension. There's every opportunity to hang on to things where you're the innocent victim. How could they say that? How could they do that? How, I've lost control of this. How could this happen to me? What do you do about it? I think Aunty Ruth's imprisonment was because she didn't let go. The word forgiveness in the New Testament is to let go, to divorce oneself, to separate oneself. So you're hanging on to something. And to forgive is to let it go, to give it over, not to hold on to it. You think that's easy? <laughs> you know it's not easy. Jesus not only taught about the importance of forgiveness and the crucial issue of it affects your relationship with God. If you don't forgive, then he won't forgive. There's a break in relationship. It's not the fullest potential. You are a dispenser of his grace and love. It acts as a block to what he wants to do through us. But Jesus didn't just talk about it. He did it. And he did it on the cross. He did it throughout his whole life. But especially you see it on the cross. And this has been a life verse for me. It started when I was raising up a Christian school from zero, ground zero. Fifteen different denominations, scores of children and parents. The church that I was pastoring for offered not a single dollar to the enterprise. Gave the time, my time, but I had to raise the money with a board. 
And so we had this elaborate strategy of raising finance for this Christian school in our city in Australia. And one of the deacons in our church pulled a power play. He spoke to the senior pastor and said, if you allow Robert to do this and this and this regarding this school fundraising, then I'm pulling out of the church. And that meant huge amounts of resources, monetary financial resources that he had supplied for years. So the co-founder, my spiritual father, came to me as a junior pastor in the church and said, you can't do it. Now, I didn't express anger. I don't regret anything I did or said. I was careful what I publicly said. But I tell you what, behind the scenes, if I had the authority of King David in 1 Kings chapter 1, I would have, without qualm, laid him on the ground and... I don't get angry often. But we have been building for so long and so many pressures and stresses to get this Christian school off the ground in buildings and permanent premise and land that I snapped. I think it's the angriest I've ever got. I let it out to God in my prayer journal and I let it out to my wife. And somewhere in the journey, God's grace, I found this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23. And it's in Mary uh, Elizabeth, thank you. Amanda read from verse 21 to 25. In the context, Peter is talking about how do you handle suffering. Peter, Peter, Apostle Peter, 1 Peter. How do you handle suffering? And then he comes into suffering between employer, employee, within families. And then he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus is the, our example. And this is New American Standard. You've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, committed no sin, nor was any guile in his mouth, deceit, while being, and this is Jesus in his humanity on the cross, Jesus on the cross was surrounded by hatred and bitterness and anger and it was thrust at him by the Romans, the Jewish leaders particularly. Colossians 3 says demonic forces. So all this hatred and bitterness, look at Matthew 27 and what they threw at Jesus on the cross. Everything that belied the fact that God cared, that God loved him, that he was his only begotten son in whom I am well pleased. The things I hurled at him. Now, how did Jesus on the cross handle that? How come he didn't get angry and bitter? And how come he didn't get resentful on the cross? How could he forgive? How could he let go? How could he release what was happening to him and not hang on to? How did he do it? It says it here in verse 23. On the cross, in his humanity, divine, totally absolute. Human, divine, totally absolute. But in his humanity, while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So they threw insults. He didn't insult back. Slapped him. He didn't slap back. In his suffering, he kept on entrusting himself to the righteous judge. This is Jesus. This is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the Son of God, the only begotten. This is the eternal God who is showing us an example of how in his humanity, as a model of us in our humanity, how we can handle the injustice that come against us so that we don't hang on and become bitter and end up in prison in our body like my Auntie Ruth. There's only one judge, even in Jesus' life, even in the Son of God's life, there's one righteous judge. So my question is, what are you hanging on to? What are you holding? Living or dead? It's a person. It's an event. It's a situation. 
that's indelibly sketched into your imagination. And you can bring it up whenever you want. The insult, the look, the tilt of the head, the false accusation, the pushing in line, the promotion in front of you and you deserved it. What, what are you hanging on to? Start from your parents and work out. And some of it is suppressed. And we need the help of the Holy Spirit to bring it up into our conscious mind. That we can be healed. Because there are emotional scars of events in the past that you, you, you don't want to let go. And they hurt. But Jesus is here. Where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst. To loose on earth. So that the blessings of God can be loosed from heaven. And he's in the midst to bring healing. Emotional healing. So that we can give over and allow God to be the judge. Of that situation, that circumstance, that person. I... I I broke both wrists last year. That takes great talent to do that. <laughs> Within four or five weeks of one another. There were commonalities. It was in the dark, on a slope, going backwards, and with women members of my family watching as I fell to the ground. Left and then right shattered. Right shattered. Ice, black ice. Now, if you look carefully, there's a scar there. It's a plate with nine screws. Wonderful surgeons we have here in DuPage County. I know I broke my wrist. I know the event where it happened with my eldest daughters looking on and me in the dark on a slope ice in Spokane, Washington with my right arm on the ground broken and me can't believe I've done it again I've broken my wrist that sense of hopelessness and the pain and the surgery and the physical therapy But do you know, I know I did it, but there's no longer any pain. I know I broke it, but the pain associated with it, the event, I don't remember. And Jesus can do that. He can come and you can remember, forgive and forget. Not really. <laughs> You'll never forget. But Jesus can come and take that emotional hurt from what happened at that time by your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your best friend. And take Jesus can take that emotional hurt and pour in his love. If you give it to him to judge, let him be the judge. How did he do it? He did it by prayer. On the cross of Calvary, Luke, his death prayers. Coming out of the Psalms. Father, why have you forsaken me? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Father, into your hands I give you my spirit. The death prayers of Jesus are linked to 1 Peter 2.23. How did Jesus allow God to be the judge? He prayed it. He gave it to God. He entrusted God. He kept on entrusting it to God through prayer. He kept on entrusting to the righteous judge. Kept on entrusting to the righteous judge. In prayer on the cross, Jesus shows us how he handled unforgiveness. This deacon in the church, I remember very clearly, 1985, in a prayer journal, on my way to the Solomon Islands, and praying, praying in a prayer journal, giving this situation, bit power play, taking it out of my hands. I don't have any control. The, the school is going down the drain. And I'm giving it to you. You judge God. You judge. And I, I can remember in my head, throwing it up to God, throwing it up to God, driving in the car, and his face would come into my mind. And I'd make it a prayer. Make it a prayer. 
And then the feeling would come as I lay in bed to go to sleep. And his face would flash into my mind again. I made a prayer. You judge. You be the judge. Don't let me judge him. Took 21 days. I'm a slow learner. Took 21 days. Then one day, I kept on entrusting to God. I threw it up to the righteous judge. I gave norm to God. He never came back. Norm never came back. A year later, I came to the church. There was Norm put out my hand and said, Brother, good to see you. And it was genuine. It was real. It was fair income. Because Jesus took the hurt out through entrusting him to be the right judge. Let's have a moment of silence. If God is bringing to your mind an event, give it to him in prayer, just where you are seated. He knows all about it. He was there. Tell him again. Tell him again what happened. Tell him again your feelings. And let him be the judge. Let him be the judge.